relatively recently I've started asking myself whether people like even Einstein or Dirac really ask themselves, what is time? I think it's very easy not to ask these questions. There's, there's, I, I, I'm increasingly thinking of looking at, well I have been doing it, but looking at it more, looking at the questions that actually the great physicists did not ask. I think the easiest way I can explain how I think about Platonia is to take the absolute simplest example of what you could hope to model a universe by. And that is just three particles in otherwise empty space. Those three particles in any instant will form a triangle. And then Platonia is just the set of all possible triangles. You just think of all possible triangles that, that differ in that way. They have uh, different values for the lengths of the sides. And I called it Platonia because the Plato believed in perfect mathematical forms. And actually the simplest non-trivial mathematical form you can have is, is a triangle. But any mathematical form could be like that. So. That's the sort of mathematical definition of, of Platonia. Now, what's the connection with trying to model the world? Well, for me, the most basic concept really comes from the fact that if I close my eyes and open them again, I see a picture, I see structure, I see you, I see the room. And I think everybody has this intuitive picture of the world in an instant and now being so to speak like a three-dimensional snapshot. You can take snapshots uh, and then you, you, you lose the third dimension but you in your mind's eye you can put the third dimension back into it. When you look at a snapshot you can immediately guess the distances between objects and things like that. Before Einstein came along, the basic idea that people had of, of the world was that it was of the universe, was that in any instant, in any now, it was just some three-dimensional structure which was defined mathematically, at least that's what physicists thought, and that in the passage as, as time passed, this structure just changes continuously was the assumption. 
Um, so that was really basically my idea that, that Plutonia is just, you, you say what is in the universe and then you say what are all possible configurations that the universe could have. So in, if, if there were only just three particles in the universe, it would be all possible triangles that they could form. And then a history of the universe would just be a succession of those three triangles. So, so Plutonia is like a landscape and every point in that landscape is actually a triangle. And then a history of the universe this is before we talk about quantum mechanics, what we call a classical universe, is just a continuous path in that landscape, which I called Plutonia. So, so that's the basic idea. Now, just as I was, just as I'd completed finishing the end of time, I started really thinking seriously about size. And if my three particles are the whole universe, to talk about its size, I need a ruler, a scale, a measuring rod outside the universe to say how large it is. And that doesn't make any sense. There's nothing outside the universe. By definition, the universe is everything. So then I, I realized that actually I should modify my notion of Plutonia and say it's only the shape that counts. So now my triangle is actually defined by two numbers because you only need two angles to define the shape of a triangle. So this is the house I, I grew up in and one of my very earliest memories from childhood, I, I used to sleep in the top left uh, bedroom, the top left window there, and it was a very dark night. I'd been asleep quite some time and I suddenly was woken up and all the family were standing at the window there and it was dark, but over in that direction, the sky was all red and it was Coventry burning from the famous notorious raid of the Germans bombing. Coventry. So that was one of my earliest memories. I was three and a half at the time. My mother was very keen on, 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 on a small holding and, and, and gardening. And my father said she got it from reading Voltaire's Candide and at the end he says we must tend our garden. <laughs> anyway, um, my mother got a, a, a mare that was in, in foal and unfortunately the, the mare died in giving birth to the foal and my mother brought it up in the kitchen with, with a bottle there and, and the foal was, was brought up there for several months and then later on he, he was taken out but he'd remembered very clearly what it was. And sometime he was out here and he, he, he got loose and he went straight into the kitchen, down through the veranda, into the kitchen, and with his nose opened a cupboard and knocked the lid off the bin where the, where the bread was and got out a loaf of bread and was eating it. So that, of course, was a, a, a nice memory from childhood. So, um, yeah, we, we played here in the garden. And over there is, is a fig tree. This is where my love of fruit comes from to quite an extent because my mother used to make sure we had plenty of good fruit including figs and things so that's a bit of my life here um, I don't know if there's much more to say no I think that's probably enough for the moment if I have a triangle I can hold it in this room in a certain position I can put the center of mass somewhere and I can change the orientation I can move it around and that's meaningful in this room because the walls of the room are stable. It provides a proper framework. If you're considering the whole universe, where is the room? Where are the walls of the room? They can't be there because the universe is everything. So the advantage of introducing the idea of Plutonia is to get rid of that fictional room, that container in which the triangles in, in that particular model is living. And also it gets rid of the idea of time because there isn't, if you're going to talk about time, ultimately you need some clock. Now for us in this room, we could use the sun. The sun is moving and that is a measure of time. And for most of humanity's existence, that was the only measure of time was the motion of the sun. Any clock that we use is ultimately based on the motion of some object within the universe relative to the whole universe. And therefore you must get rid of that. When I was 16, one of my uncles gave us all 200 pounds and I was very keen to have a telescope and this was advertised, the observatory and a 12 and a quarter inch reflecting telescope, that's a big telescope, was 
put up for sale by a man who was 74 who lived in southern England. And I went down to visit him. He was a very nice man. He had started in getting interested in astronomy when he was 14 and he was 74 then, so that was 60 years. And all that period, Saturn, which takes 30 years to go around its orbit, had gone, completed two complete orbits. And all of this was transported from Dorset in southern England by a furniture company, a removal company in Oxford and brought here and erected all for 200 pounds. It was amazing. But that was a lot of money in those days. And I was uh, very keen and I used to make drawings of the moon and observe Jupiter and Mars. It was all very exciting when you're a teenager. For a long time we thought that the main value in this work would be in trying to find a quantum theory of gravity to unify quantum mechanics with the theory of gravity. And that remains our hope. However, what we've realized, my collaborators and I, in the last two years or so, is that we might be able to say something much more directly and persuasively about where the, what is the origin of the difference between the past, the future, and the future. This is the problem of the so-called arrow of time. Maybe the way that Einstein found this absolutely wonderful theory, and it, there's no question, it's an absolutely wonderful theory, and nobody is ever going to take Einstein's glory away from that creation. But maybe it can be put into a, in, into a better form where, where it begins to provide an answer to this very mysterious question of, well, uh, what is the Big Bang? What was it like? Why did it, is there some reason why it had to be as it appears to have been? How, how, how come structure forms in the universe? All of these things look to us as if we can give a better description within this framework, which we call shape dynamics, because we only say the shape counts. It, it, you, you already get the idea from talking about triangles. Uh, but of course, it's much more complicated than that. If we allow for billions upon billions of particles in the universe, it's, it's much more complicated. But the underlying idea is always the same, that only the shape counts. Oh, no, 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 this is potentially very big. Yes. No, no, it, 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 it's, it's, um, it, 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 uh, it might really change things. This is starting in 10 minutes, the harvest. I think I might go to that. You might like to possibly take pictures of people as they go. The man who was there, that's the man, the only man in the village who's been in it longer than I have. Oops. That was shaking the damsons off, and then we put them out and let people... Yeah, this is Tim Koslowski, the German collaborator. There he is. There's me, proudly looking at all the damsons we'd, we'd brought down. That's my mulberry tree, after it had been trimmed. The mulberry tree <laughs> had got very heavy and the branches were liable to break off, so they'd come and... That's it. Oh no, this is my, <laughs> this is my grandson, three months old. Here he is, Jonah pictured in Pretoria. Yes, he's three months old and really beginning to look around at the world. He's a gorgeous little boy. Aren't you, Jonah? 
<laughs> you drop a cup and it shatters and there's no way you can put it together. You crack eggs and you make an omelette. There's no way you can unmake the omelette and, and eggs come back out again. And there's all these processes happening uh, all around the world uh, and in the universe. And, and all of these unidirectional processes, the arrow of time as it's called, it always points in the same direction. And this is a great mystery given the nature of the laws of physics as we know them, the laws of nature as first discovered by Newton, but then uh, by Einstein and more recently in particle physics. And, and the problem can be stated very simply. Imagine you have a, a, a timeline. So it's as if you have a, a, an invisible washing line, which is the line of time, and there's just no direction on it. There's no, there's, it's not a one-way street. There's not a, 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 a sign saying this is the future and that's the past. It's just, just a bare line like that. And then you can imagine the successive shapes of the universe at successive instants. So you could imagine having a picture of each successive shape of the universe and you could hang them along the washing line. Now they change continuously so that you could order them in a definite order. But there's no way if you started doing that task and I started doing it independently and we said, well, we'll try and work from left to right, uh, as you see it, from right to left, um, there is no guarantee that we'd come up with the same choice of, of direction because b both are equally good. So, so this has been a, a bit of a puzzle. So if the fundamental law says there's no uh, choice of direction, why is it that everything we see does have a very definite direction? This is, this is very strange. Even just the, the account that I'm giving has got a definite direction in it. We have this very deep feeling that there is a unique past out there. The past is settled once and for all. And there's, there's no way you, you can do anything about that. And then I suppose it may be partly to do with Christian theology that God created in the book of Genesis is that God created the universe out of nothing. Um, and, and then we have the Big Bang theory and, and so forth. But then we started looking at, uh, started thinking about the simplest solutions of Newton's theory of gravity, just three particles interacting with each other. And then we realized that actually, if you have three particles, in each instant they, they form a triangle. The, the triangle has a shape. It is possible to find, with, with certain natural assumptions which would, or restrictions which would correspond to this being a toy model of the whole universe, you can see what would be a history of the universe what would look like. And it turns out to be very interesting. There's a, there's a fact which has actually been known for 100 years. Well, there's two facts. One has been known for over 200 years and another for 100 years about these solutions. And it is actually that there's no way that there's something special out at one end that you could call an initial condition. But what it is, is that as you come in, say, from, from this side way out here, which you might think was in the past, you come up here and the shapes change in a very characteristic way until you get to a certain uniquely defined point where actually the motion, the change is, is sort of somewhat chaotic. And then it goes out the other side beyond this unique point and then it goes out to what it was like over there. So actually the solution defines, divides exactly into half. There is the absolutely uniquely defined point in the middle where it goes out in, in, in the two directions. So we call this the Janus point after the Roman god that looks in, in two ways. Uh, and then we say that the, the way of interpreting this, this solution 
is to say that actually there are two histories in there because as you go away from the central point where it's all a bit like primordial chaos, if you have instead of three particles, you have a large number, thousands upon thousands, this central region is typically very, it's, it's very uniform. It's like a swarm of bees, like a uniform swarm of bees where the bees are all moving in a random way relative to each other. But that's what it's like there. But as you go out in these two directions, structure forms and you get, you get pairs of particles going around each other in a very regular way. So you get structure forming in a very beautiful way. And it's very natural, if you were living in this universe, if you were a bee in this universe, you'd say, from this point on, if you were out here, you couldn't see through to the other side of the swarm. You'd say, this is my direction of time. And you'd think that the, your universe began at this swarming state, which you would call the Big Bang. But bees out here would say, ah, that is our direction of time and our universe began there. So you have two arrows of time going out and they're effectively completely separate. And this seems to us to have the potential for an explanation of, of the, this great mystery of the arrow of time. Now this is just pure point particles interacting in, in, in Newton's theory of gravity, which is over 300 years old. We really have to do a great deal more work with Einstein's general theory of relativity with matter. This is a much more complicated story, but the architectonic structure of Einstein's theory is, is basically the same as in Newtonian theory. There is still this, it's certainly in, 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 in a large class of solutions which seem to be appropriate for describing our universe, it looks as if there is this Janus point and that structure forms. And we, we know this is exactly what the universe does look like. We look back, we see the, what's called the microwave background where the universe does look very like a swarm of bees. And then ever since then, the, galax the stars and the galaxies have all formed. So the overall picture fits. And so our, our, our conjecture is that, so to speak, uh, this is all at the classical level too before we begin to bring in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics could change this picture quite a lot, but basically at the classical level, which has been a problem for 150 years, we think we may have the solution to it. So of course this is, this is very exciting for us. So this is the start of the fields that my parents bought and my, my mother farmed as a small holding. And over here on, the, on this side here is where I actually as a boy walked behind the plough with being pulled by a horse. Just a single one, one, uh, one sh uh, thing to separate the ground and pull by a horse. And then it extends for a few hundred yards that direction there. So I'll, I'll go off in that direction now. Um, Oh, and one interesting thing is in the war, I forgot that, in the war we had to produce as much food as we, as we could and there were posters saying, dig for victory. So particularly here, my mother grew all sorts of vegetables and potatoes and ever since then it's been called the dig for victory. Now, there was something else I wanted to say. Um, what was it? No, no, no. The, now, the point about the, the Janus point, why we found it particularly appropriate is perhaps actually nothing to do with the Janus point, but we wanted an image of, of Janus. And, and I, as everybody does, you go to Google Images, and we found one where superimposed upon this particularly good Janus image was the statement, God of beginnings. And that beginnings was what was so appropriate because in each direction, a universe begins. So, so it was actually spot on. It was a congenital heart condition. It was the uh, elder brother of the boy Jonah whose pictures are on the unit. No, it was very, very sad.
he lived for 10, 10 weeks. And uh, so we have a, a beautiful little memorial stone in the local stone here. So here it is, Noah Baba Kasunji. He's a um, lovely boy he was. In fact, all, nearly all of the old gravestones are, are this Haunton stone, the local stone. But I think it's entirely possible that the impression we have of motion when you see my hands moving is something that somehow comes into being through consciousness. Now, it's very interesting. Galileo was the first person in the modern age who made the distinction between what later became known as primary and secondary qualities. The British philosopher, the empiricist John Locke made that clear distinction. And Galileo said that he thought that in, in the world, the only things that really exist were figures, that is, objects that move. So there was motion and figures and, and change like that. And all the other things that we experience, the colors, the sounds, the tastes, and even the tickling under the armpits, the titillation, uh, somehow is, is, a, is created by, by consciousness. Now, I take quite seriously the idea that Galileo didn't actually go far enough, that he, the, the distinction might be the right one, but, but, but not what he puts in the primary qualities and the secondary. And I say that because it's the question of where does our sense of the past and motion comes from? Uh, now, Galileo was quite convinced that motion of things exists outside in the external world. But if you ask yourself, I think there's only two really solid bits of evidence that I, in my present conscious state, have for the passage of time and that I have a past. One is that the memories that are laid down in, 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 in my mind, I mean, as I speak to you, I am very aware that we were speaking about something else an hour and a half ago and things like that and my whole experience of my life. That is very firmly in my mind as I speak. And the other thing is, as I move my hand like that, I see the motion. I see the hand here and here, and it's all there in one. And you will see it as, you, as, as you're looking at me. So that, I think, is absolutely the evidence that we have for motion and for the past. Now, it is definite a fact that neuroscientists now can show that very often when we think we see motion, it is actually an illusion which the brain has created for us. Certainly some of our impressions of motion are just created by, by consciousness, the way, the way the brain processes things. And the brain is always telling us a narrative. The brain is always guessing what narrative to tell us in, in, in our conscious awareness. This here is land that my brother used to farm for many years and he, he actually removed the hedges, there were many smaller fields and down the bon along the bottom there's, there's a beautiful stream and there's lots of these alder trees which grow near water and then on the other side there's another field, a big open field which my brother also farmed um, and then it was down there, we'll go and have a look at it where we were listening to the radio and, and swimming in the brook with our children uh, when Boris Becker won his first Wimbledon title. So let's go down and have a look at that, shall we? Just here, the, the stream is deep enough to swim in, and we came, my wife and I came here 30 years ago in high summer with our children to swim and have a picnic here. And it was Wimbledon, and it was the year that Boris Becker won the title for the first time. and. Uh, as my wife was German, of course, she was extremely excited about it. It was very dramatic, and uh, we all remember vividly how the, when Becker finally had the winning shot, the uh, commentator shouted out, this is three firsts, the first German, the first unseeded player, and the first under 18 or 18-year-old 18 to win the title. So it was very dramatic. And 
in a way it's also an expression, I think, of how life has become less direct. There's hardly any children now who swim in a stream like we did when I was a boy or when our children were young. That's already now gone, that's 30 years ago. And they go to very nice indoor swimming pools and it's all very hygienic and perfect. But perhaps the magic of nature and quite a bit of life perhaps is lost and they don't know what it's really like. Uh, it's already 15 and a half years ago we were together in California, which is often when, you're, when they're away from home that they get confused. Uh, we'd rented a recreation well, vehicle, an RV as the Americans call it. And we had a bit of a drama with it because the battery that powered the internal things failed on us. Next morning we had to take it to the recommended garage, which I found in, that was in Santa Cruz. When we got it all into the garage and they said, well, we'll work on it, it'll be ready in the afternoon. And uh, so I inquired where there was a good place to eat. And in Santa Cruz, there's a pier goes right out about a mile into the Pacific Ocean. And we were told there was a very good restaurant for eating sea salmon out there. So we walked out and indeed it was a lovely day and we sat down and we were enjoying the food and then I started talking about what had happened and I suddenly realised that she, she didn't really remember it. It was sort of complete blank. It was very difficult for a few years uh, where she still was functioning to quite an extent. And The, the qualia are these secondary qualities. And I, for me, the person who wrote really most persuasively about this was the Anglo-Irish philosopher, Bishop Barclay, who really brings home this extraordinary fact that actually everything that makes our life vital, or perhaps I feel it more than Bishop Barclay, uh, the joy of eating good food, going and picking blackberries, and all these sort of things, the taste of these things, the, the feeling of jumping into cold water and swimming, all of these things which make life exciting seem to have no place in the external world. We, we can match them. The color is correlated with wavelength of light in, in the theory. It, it's very strange. I mean, if there really are only the qualia, only the qualia are real, why is it that the correlations between the qualia, which seem to make so much sense. Why do they tell us so insistently that there is an external world, that I'm sitting in this church that, you know, was built, they started building it a thousand years ago, and it, it, the columns behind me were, uh, are 850 years old, and, and what, what, what's going on here? It's, it's very strange, but actually all of the, uh, all of the confidence I have about when I said that these columns were built, that the arches were, these Norman arches are 850 years old, I have memories of that. I read about it in books saying that's what it is. And I've got that clearly memory minute. I turn around and lo and behold, there they are, these beautiful arches and the paintings on them. It's just fantastic. Where, do, where does that come from? This is this, this great thing. There's, there's a line I love in, in Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream where Hippolyta is is saying there must have been something real in, in what these young people went through in the night in, in the forest. And he, he, he said, she says that, you know, they told it over and it, 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 it's a consistent story. It grows to a thing of great coherence, consistency. It grows to a thing of great consistency. And that's what the world is like. I think Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream is, is, is a poetic representation of this, this fantastic universe that we live in. It, it's, it's coherence, it's, it's ordered, but also it's magical quality because the qualia, the tastes and sounds, when I listen to a Beethoven um, string quartet, where does that come from? You can't find that in the, in the fundamental equations of physics. That, 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 that is completely... Dis the most wonderful equations in physics that the Dirac equation in quantum mechanics, Einstein's field equations. You can't find any trace of Beethoven's works there.
I love mulberries, so the, the, almost the first thing I did when we moved in here was to plant the, the, the mulberry tree there. And I have to say it is turned into an absolutely magnificent mulberry tree. If you go to Stratford-upon-Avon, you can see the grandson of Sh Shakespeare's mulberry tree. He had a famous mulberry tree. Uh, and that one, the grandson, it's a scion of a scion, was planted at much the same as mine. And I have to say mine is quite a better. <laughs> better than Shakespeare's, it's done better. Mind you, I had the benefit of going to the top uh, horticultural expert in the country to get my one. But it is, it is really magnificent. And actually working on this garden has been a little bit like working on my theory. I've tended to think about things for quite a long time and sort of have the feeling I wanted something. And then suddenly the idea has, has come right, that there are three benches in the garden, one there near the fountain, one down in the corner there, and one in the far corner there. And literally for 35 years, we were struggling to find somewhere where we could put a conservatory or a summer house to, to, to sort of sit outside. And we couldn't think and we couldn't think. And then suddenly it occurred to me about five years ago that that's just the right place in the far corner down there. And we found a perfect one. It's just nice for two or to squeeze three people to sit in. So, Getting the garden in shape has been really a long process over four decades now and it's been a little, little, little bit like that with my theory about time not existing. Time of year thou mayst in me behold, when yellow leaves, or none or few, do hang upon those boughs that shake against the cold. Bare ruined, bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. That's one of Shakespeare's most famous sonnets, Sonnet 73. It's the one with the famous line about night, death's second self that seals up all in sleep. In me thou seest the fading of such day, as after, no, in me thou seest the something of such day, that after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away, death's second self that seals up all in rest. There have been two really big influences which are behind the way I think about science. One is, well, there's been several, but one very powerful was Leibniz with his, insistent, with his insistence that the real world is about variety and how variety is ordered. And the other is definitely more aesthetic and this would be Shakespeare. Now again, there's a marvelous passage in Midsummer Night's Dream, where Bottom wakes up from his dream, from a, a sleep. And first of all, he complains that his companions have left him alone. The first thing he says is, call me when my cue comes. And then he says, God's bodskins or something, they've left me in, in the wood and gone off. And then he says, I've had a most wonderful dream, a rare vision. And I'll get Peter Quince to write it a, a ballad, and it shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom, infinite depth of richness. And, and then there's another lovely line. He says, man is but an ass if he go about to expound this dream. And it's wonderfully ironic, because Shakespeare has just expounded that whole dream as his author. Yeah. And, and there it is, and yet he's putting these, for me these are among the, the most wonderful words, and they're prose. Shakespeare was the greatest prose writer of English as well as the greatest poet. Uh, that sense of the infinite depth and wonder of the world, 
so I guess if there's an aesthetic that is, is, is driving me, and that has certainly been very important in these ideas of uh, thinking about the arrow of time and structure growing in the world, getting richer, and really that the direction of time is the one that leads from disorder and essentially where there's no interesting structure to ever growing richer structure. And interestingly, I, I was, if you read the book about Paul Dirac, The Strangest Man, he sat down and he wrote his philosophy. And, and his, one thing that he, he's put in his philosophy is that, that intelligent life would never end. And it actually was driving his attempts, a failed attempt to create a, a theory which clearly part of the driving force behind it was that sort of things would go on forever. I mean, I, I can contemplate my own death with, without much worry. That, it's not a concern to me. I must say, uh, I wouldn't be happy at the thought that Beethoven's music and Shakespeare's plays will be lost, but maybe they will. I mean, Shakespeare's 18th sonnet ends with the lines... So long as men can breathe and eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. But it starts with so long. <laughs> so Shakespeare was pretty realistic, even Ovid, in contrast, Ovid, whom Shakespeare greatly admired, Ovid ends one of his great works with saying, I shall live forever, I. <laughs> Shakespeare doesn't say that. Shakespeare never boasts that he is going to live forever. The, the furthest he gets, so long as men can breathe and eyes can see. So that's quite interesting, the, the difference between Shakespeare and Ovid. The dream of an English person with a, a garden like this is to have a beautiful lawn, absolutely extending down into the distance with nicely cut lines so it looks really beautiful. But my wife, being very German, was very green. Her ideal was to have natural products. So for three years we had a cow and she used to get up at six o'clock in the morning and milk the cow that was called Molly and we had ducks and chickens, so it was all that. And then she decided she was going to grow vegetables and have flowers in this garden. And at that stage, we had the lawn in the middle and the borders down the side, as it is now. But she decided the better place to grow the vegetables was here in the middle. So she'd learned that the way to do that was to kill the grass by putting down huge old carpets. So she got a hold of a lot of carpets that people had thrown out, laid them all out over the lawn so that the grass was killed. And then with great energy, she dug it up. And then we had vegetables and flowers here. And I must say, it was a good place to have it because this is where you get the most sun in, in, in the garden. So everything prospered and the, the, the flowers were absolutely beautiful. But my beautiful lawn was <laughs> destroyed. Um, uh, but eventually then, sadly, as my wife got ill with her Alzheimer's, she had to give it up. So then, uh, some years ago, I reverted to the old design we'd had, so, we, so we've got the lawn now. It isn't freshly mown, but, but it will be fairly soon. Mm -hmm.